So it is so amazing the way that God changes lives, and I so much appreciate uh, Ted and his story and his ministry, and he is available after the service. If you feel like, hey, I need to talk to that guy, I want him to pray for me or, or just to provide some counsel for me, he's going to be here with the prayer team at the front, and he'd be glad uh, to minister to you. If you can't get to him today, uh, tomorrow night and every Monday night, he is at the McCulloch campus at 630, leading Celebrate Recovery, and uh, it is a great place for uh, healing and for freedom from your hurts and habits and hang-ups, and so uh, you might want to check that out. Hey, if, uh, if you got a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, let me encourage you to turn to the Gospel of Mark chapter 5. It's going to be our text today. If you don't have a Bible with you or an app on your device, grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 998. 998, you will find Mark chapter 5. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, uh, just take one of these with you. It's our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, God will actually change your life. And, and uh, that's important to us. Hey, we're uh, wrapping up our, our freeway series today. And uh, it's been a great series because we want to be free. Uh, right? You know, we want freedom. And uh, that's why so many of you have been faithful in this, we invited you to come and participate in the services, and you guys have been faithful to do that. Uh, we've given away about a thousand of the freeway workbooks. Uh, we've had about a thousand people in freeway life groups, and we have heard story after story of life change that is happening. Uh, you've gotten to see some of the baptisms coming out of that uh, because God is at work changing lives. We want to be free, and here's the really cool part Jesus wants us to be free as well. He actually wants us to be free. He told us this in his very first sermon recorded in Scripture. It's in Luke chapter 4, and, and he kind of shares his mission statement. Uh, he's quoting the prophet Isaiah, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty for the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In other words, Jesus said, I came here to set the captives free, to give sight to the blind, and to take those who are broken and imprisoned in bondage and to liberate them. So Jesus wants us to be free. And he said, this is my mission, and then he fulfilled his mission. Today's story is an example of that. Mark chapter 5, uh, beginning at verse 1. Now, some of you have read this before, and you're like, this is a cool story. I like this. I'm just going to encourage you to read it with fresh eyes. And, and notice the details. Soak in the details. But if you've never seen this story before, read this story before, uh, it's a, an incredible story. And I'm going to encourage you this week to just read it again, maybe a couple of times, and let the power of God amaze you. So it starts off this way. They, they which is Jesus and the disciples, came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. This is on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. It's a non-Jewish area at the time. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces." No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you, I beg you by God, do not torment me. For Jesus was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now, a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged Jesus, saying, send us into the pigs, let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country, and the people came out to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. 
And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. So as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And Jesus did not permit him, but said, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. What an incredible story about an encounter with Jesus. And, and I love this account of life change because in so many ways it's a picture of us. Okay? Uh, and so I want us to look at the story and see how similar we are to the demon-possessed guy and his story of freedom. Because first of all, like him, we were all prisoners of sin. We were all prisoners of sin. Now, I know uh, maybe you've never run naked through cemeteries scaring people. Can't say you haven't, but maybe you haven't. Uh, and, you know, and, and if you did, aren't you glad that nobody was there with a camera phone filming it and posting it on YouTube? See, a lot of us got away with stupidity pre-recording uh, everything, uh, pre-social media. But, okay, so maybe we've never done that. Maybe we've never been possessed by a legion of evil spirits. Uh, but we've all been self-destructive. We've all been self-destructive. Maybe in little ways, maybe in big ways, we've all lived as captives to sin. I, I mean, maybe it's just normal, everyday selfishness or greed or envy or jealousy that's poisoning your relationships. Or, or maybe it's addictions, you know, to drugs or alcohol or pornography or food that are driving your life into ruin. Or maybe you've got anger issues. You know, you lose control and, and you go off and say things that are hurtful or do things that are hurtful to the people that you love as you give in to the rage that's inside of you. Or maybe... Maybe you just are, you know, kind of captured by self-loathing. Maybe to the point where you cut yourself or you starve yourself or, or maybe you fantasize about killing yourself. You see, we're all prisoners of sin and we're trapped in our rebellion. We're desperate for freedom. We're angry at ourselves. We're angry at our circumstances. We're angry at God. We're all prisoners of sin until Jesus sets us free. And Jesus set us free. Uh, now, I love the details in this story. I, I mean, I hope you picked up on them. First of all, you got this crazed demoniac guy, right? I, I mean, and he is a scary guy. He, he's out there, and he's a wild man. And, and nobody can do anything with him. They've chained him up to leave him to die. I mean, that's their treatment for him, right? We're going to chain you to the tombs. You're going to die. Uh, and, and, and he broke the chains. He ripped them apart. He shredded the chains. I mean, that's, that's kind of scary, isn't it? And, it? and it actually says no one could subdue him. So he was out of control, and, and nothing could be done about it. And he meets Jesus, and what does he do? He falls on his knees, and he begs for mercy. Now, you can think about this. This guy that, that nobody can subdue is begging for mercy from Jesus. He, the demons know that he's God in the flesh, that he's the son of God, and he has the power and authority over them, and so they start asking for mercy. Wow. And then there's the pigs. I mean, this is just such an odd story, but you've got the pigs, and I always wondered, what, what's the point of the pigs in the story? And, and here's one of the points, at least the way that the pigs are important to me. Uh, and not just because of bacon, okay? Uh, but, but the pigs are important to me because I grew up kind of in a hyper-rational environment where everybody was kind of starting to say, well, you know, the, the, the demon stuff in the New Testament, it, it's really just kind of like mental illness. But what about the pigs? I mean, seriously, what about the pigs? I mean, something left this guy and went into the pigs and the pigs rushed into the lake and as someone said last night, they committed suicide. And... Uh, <laughs> I stole that, okay? So don't credit me. And, and they did. I mean, something happened to the pigs. The evil spirits are real. We're in a battle. We're, we're fighting a fight. And, and so then you've got the people who come out to see all this stuff, and they're afraid, get this, because the guy is clothed and seated in his right mind. They're not afraid of the guy being crazy and running around naked through the cemeteries. They're afraid because he's in his right mind. 
That's, that's just a wild story. You see, Jesus changed his life. Jesus set him free. And Jesus set us free. Through his death and resurrection on the cross, he paid for our sins and he set us free. First of all, he set us free uh, from the power of sin to enslave us. He set us free from the power of death to hold us in fear. And he set us free from the power of hell to hold us captive forever. Jesus Christ has set us free. Has he set you free? It's really easy to talk in the big picture. Jesus set us free. Jesus is the Lamb of God who paid for the sins of the world. But what about you? Has Jesus Christ set you free? Has he changed your life? Have you come to that place where at some time in your life, you're like the the demoniac and you're on your knees begging God for mercy? Because until we get to that point, we're, we're just hanging out around Jesus, but we haven't really surrendered to him and said, Jesus, take control of my life. And, and, And here's the thing. I don't want you just to come to church and be good people. That doesn't change your destiny. That doesn't change the power of sin of your life. That doesn't change, uh, you know, the ultimate result of hell. And, and, and Jesus wants to set you free. He wants to change your life. He wants to forgive your sins. He wants to make you his child. So has that happened in your life? Have you come to that place where you recognize Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world and that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, personal, was raised from the dead and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, a commitment that you don't mind sharing in baptism, telling the world that you're a follower of Jesus and he's changed your life. You see, if you haven't done that, if if Jesus hasn't set you free, then stop listening to me and start talking to God and just go ahead and surrender to him. Just say, I need you to change my life. I need you to set me free. You're my Lord and Savior and, and, and he'll change you. You see, Jesus has the power to set you free. We see that in the life of this demoniac. Because that guy went from naked and crazy to clothed and in his right mind. And some of us are sitting here thinking, yeah, but I'm not that crazy. Really? Are you sure? Because the last time I checked, the, the uh, you know, publicly understood definition of insanity was what? Doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting what? Different results. Oh, you guys know that too. Okay. And... and And so that's insanity. So, you know, how many of the things are we doing in our life where we're just doing the same things over and over again and we're hoping for different results? Like, for instance, your marriage. You know, nobody stands at the altar and says, I do, hoping to be miserable. And yet, how many people are miserable in their relationship? And, and they're thinking, I didn't want it to be like this. I want to be happy. I want to have a great marriage. I want to love my spouse. I, I want us to just have a joy-filled marriage. And, and here's the thing. And yet every day you get up and you do the same thing over and over and over again. Maybe God wants to change you, change your life, change your marriage. And, and, and see, the thing is, we're just hoping for a miracle that suddenly our spouse will be different, right? God fix them. But if you'll invite God to change your life, he'll change you, he'll change your marriage, he'll change your attitude, he'll change your approach, he'll change the the routine of your life. Same thing is true with your kids. We all want our children to grow up to be happy, healthy, functioning, responsible, mature adults. And some of us have doubts along the way, right? And and maybe we need to say, okay, God, uh, I, I don't want to just do the same thing I'm doing because it doesn't seem to be working. So so maybe we need to change the, the attitude of the family. Maybe we need to change the routine of the family. Maybe we need to change the discipline in the family. And, and, and God, I need you to change my attitude about my kids so that I can be the mom or dad that you want me to be. Or what about our habits? You know, we, we, we kind of live our lives and we kind of do the same routine and yet we're captive to the same sin and we pray, God, I, I don't want to be captive to the sin anymore, but we don't change any of our routines. We don't change any of our habits. We don't change any of our patterns. And for some, it just is as simple as showing up on Monday night at Celebrate Recovery and saying, okay, I'm messed up. I need some help. And let the people there help you. But we've got to change our pattern. We've got to change something so that, that, that we're not still acting crazy and see Jesus will change your heart he will change your future he'll change your mind he wants to alter how you see the world how you see yourself 
how you see others. I mean, Jesus puts his Holy Spirit in us to teach us and to guide us into freedom. And, and he gives us the Bible that tells us what to believe and how to live so that we can live free. So are you ready for freedom? Because Jesus set us free so that we could live free. Live free. That's the purpose. Jesus actually said that. John chapter 8, he said, If the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. God, God really wants us to live in freedom, and we want to live in freedom. So how do we do this? How do we actually live in freedom? Uh, I'm going to share with you some ideas, okay? They're, they're not like an all-encompassing, this is everything you need to know about living free. Uh, but these are just some, some thoughts that will help you on the way to freedom. And, and if they uh, uh, kind of intersect with your life, great. And if they don't, then uh, hopefully one out of the three will. Because uh, these are just some, some things that maybe we need to focus on that will help us to live free. So first of all, if you want to live free, celebrate new life celebrate new life. Now, I grew up in churches as, as lifelong Baptists that did not know how to celebrate. Can I, can I just confess that? They just didn't know how to celebrate at all. They knew how to study, they knew how to pray, they knew how to serve, didn't have a clue about celebration. Uh, and, and, uh, and I can say that about Baptists because I am one, but I've also known, you know, some other people. Some of you grew up that way and you're like, yep, I know what you mean. I was in that kind of church, but some of you kind of grew up Pentecostal, right? And, and uh, you, you got look, you guys know how to celebrate. Okay, you guys really, really knew how to celebrate. Us Baptists couldn't even dance. Uh, so uh, you guys were dancing in church, just didn't understand it. But, but at the same time, uh, you know, while you knew how to celebrate, sometimes you were told that's all you could do. And there was no place for like the rejoice with those who rejoice. You got that part, but you didn't weep with those who weep. And so a lot of times you were encouraged to kind of fake it. And that's not healthy. And, and then a lot of you were, you know, raised Catholic and you just think everybody should be quiet. Shh, you know, and, and see, the thing is, we're all kind of, you know, in, in that place where we need to learn how to really celebrate new life because we're all a mess and we all need Jesus and, and he wants us to live free. So I didn't, I didn't grow up knowing how to celebrate, but here's the th reality. If Jesus Christ has changed your life, if you know that you deserve hell, but you're going to get heaven. If you know the, the, the miracle of grace and you've received mercy and you know your sins are forgiven, then be grateful. Praise God. Celebrate. Uh, by the way, that, that's part of the purpose of worship time. You know, the, the music part it is to give you an opportunity to express that thanksgiving, that gratitude, that praise to God, uh, and to let him know how much uh, you appreciate what he's done for, for you and setting you free. But if we want to live free, we need to learn how to celebrate. Celebrate the life that God has given us. And, and here's some things I've, I've noticed. Um, you can't celebrate while you're complaining. Have you noticed that too? It's like if your football team is up by 40 points and you're complaining because they're not up by 50. That, there's a lot of us that are doing that. And, and God has like transformed our lives and, and set us free and we're still focused on the one area or two areas that, that we're not happy about. And, and uh, you know, for some of us, it's like, hey, well, you know, I'm just stuck on the fact that I, I can't let go of the, the reality that I don't look like I want to look or I'm not the shape like I want to be shaped. And, and here's, can I just tell you something? You're going to get new bodies. Let it go. Okay. <laughs> What you're living in now, it's, you know, it's like a temporary, you know, you're, you're in a bus, you're traveling to the good, you know, the good place. So, you know, you can't celebrate while you're complaining. You can't celebrate as a critic. I, I, think about this. There are people that would have said, Jesus, great miracle with the guy and the demoniac, but you did it wrong. You shouldn't have sent the spirits into the pigs because then the pigs ran into the water and the people came out and they were upset because they lost money and they wanted you to leave. You could have had such a better ministry if you'd only done it this way. And we're all going, yeah, right. But we do that, don't we? Because God works miracles and we're sitting there critiquing it instead of celebrating it. And you can't really celebrate if you're judging other people. See, I love the stories of life change. I love celebrating life change, whether it's in baptisms or people telling their stories. Some of you got some stories I want to hear about how God's changing your life. And, and here's the thing. Some of you don't want to tell your stories because you're afraid other people are going to judge you. 
They're going to think less of you. And guess what? I know I've been there in those churches where somebody's telling how God's changed your life and somebody is going, yeah, but how long is it going to last? They're talking about how God has changed your life and, and somebody else is saying, yeah, well, you shouldn't have been in there in the first place. I've been there when people were expressing themselves in worship and people were judging the way they're dressed. Or they're not celebrating, you know, not expressing themselves in worship and people are judging them because they're not worshiping their way. Here's the thing. You're not celebrating God if you're judging other people. That, that's reality because celebration, living in freedom is focusing on the grace of God and the goodness of God and celebrating how he has changed your life. And if you know he's changed your life, he can change others and you celebrate when their lives are changed too. So if you want to live free, celebrate new life. And if you want to live free, this, this one's like kind of obvious, but don't return to jail. Okay? If you want to live free, don't go back to jail. Now, I share that because Scripture actually warns us about this. It's a temptation in our lives. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, It was for freedom that Christ has set you free. Therefore, stand firm and do not submit yourselves again to a yoke of slavery. So, so get this, uh, Paul's warning us saying, hey, Jesus set you free, so don't go back and willingly submit yourself to prison again. Now, he would only warn us of that if it was a temptation, a danger for us. But it's crazy to think that once we've been set free, we might choose to go back to prison. But it happens. Because freedom is less predictable than slavery. Prison is routine. I mean, somebody's telling you when to get up, when to go to bed, when to eat, what to do, when to go there, how much time you have, and, and, and it's just structure. It's known, it's certainty. And people get really comfortable in jail. Uh, my dad was a prison psychologist, and he actually told me about guys he knew that were honor inmates that were, you know, just uh, perfect in, in prison. They get out, and they would commit crimes immediately to go back because they were more comfortable in prison than being free because freedom is risky freedom can be scary freedom is you know challenging it's unknown and yet you and I were created to be free we were created to be free let's go back to the story again because this this is the verse that just just absolutely blows my mind Verse 15, it says, and, and they, the people from the town, came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion, sitting there clothed in his right mind, and they were ecstatic that he'd been healed. They were excited that God had changed his life. No, they were afraid. They were freaked out over the fact that a guy who had terrorized their community was now sane. Is that absolutely absurd but they preferred the known crazy guy to the unpredictable Jesus so they asked Jesus to leave go away we don't want you here that's just that's just amazing to me it's mind-blowing and but the truth is life change freaks people out some of you have experienced dramatic life change and it just blows people's mind. Uh, Ted, who shared his story today, he actually has got friends that go, I can't believe you're a pastor. There's no way that Ted Kamen is a pastor because they only knew the drunk. They only knew the guy that blew up his life and his family over and over and over again. And, and, and people are freaked out by life change. And here's the thing, people are afraid of the power of God because if God changes lives like that, what if he changes my life like that? What if I'm not sure that I really want him to change? But what if I, I, I kind of like my secret sins? What if he really does set me free and, I, and I'm different? And so here's the thing. If you're tempted to go back to prison, can I just encourage you to surround yourself with godly people who will encourage you and support you and walk with you on this journey to freedom? Uh, we all need that. That's, that. By the way, that's why we're, you know, try to get everyone to be involved in life groups. Because we want you to be in, in an ongoing group where people can actually provide you that encouragement up close. Because we all need it. And by the way, next, week, next weekend and the weekend following, you can sign up for life groups. And, and, and I just want to encourage you. If you've been in a freeway group and you're like, this is great. I don't want it to stop. It doesn't have to. We've got more life groups. We've got people who, who say, hey, come on, be a part. I, I want to help you on this journey of freedom. Uh, join a ministry team. 
You know, be with other people who are serving God and say, hey, I, I want to be around people who are excited about God and what he's doing in their life. I want that support uh, because we don't want you to go back to jail. If you want to live free, don't go back to jail. Celebrate new life. And if you want to live free, use your freedom to bless. Use your freedom to bless. Uh, in other words, help others, heal others, serve other people. Because God set you free for a purpose. There is a reason that he redeemed you. And he wants to take your pain, your prison experience, the things you've learned along the way, and he wants to unleash you to heal others. He wants to help you to help them so that you can be a blessing to them and help them to get free. I mean, I love Ted's story because that's what he did. He, he was all about saying, hey, I, I messed up my life for four decades and I want to help other people get sober. I want to help other people find freedom. And, and that is so cool. And all of our video stories were that way. Now let's go back to the story again. Talking about purpose. God set you free for a purpose. Uh, because this is like the only time in the Gospels that this happens. So in verse 18, it says that as Jesus was getting in the boat to leave, the man who had been possessed with the demon asked Jesus to go with him. And Jesus said no. It's the only person who ever wanted to follow Jesus that they told no, you can't go with me. Now, there's all kinds of reasons why he couldn't go with him. The big one is this. Um, he wasn't Jewish. And Jesus was going back to the, the people who were Jewish and that would have presented a problem because they'd have been keep going, who's the, non, who's, who's the Gentile guy with you guys? Why, why is there this Gentile following you? And they have to tell the story over. It would distract from the mission of Jesus. Besides that, what would happen when it was his turn to cook for dinner? You know, would he like serve bacon? I mean, I know Jesus made bacon, but I don't think he ever ate any, okay? So just uh, understand. So Jesus says, no, you can't go with me. But listen to what he said. Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And the man went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. I, I love this because Jesus didn't say, okay, um, what I want you to do is take a course on witnessing, or I want you to go to seminary, or I want you to take this discipleship courses and become certified, and then go home and tell. No, he just said, look, God's changed your life. You go to your friends and your family. You tell them how God's had mercy on you. And because the man experienced freedom, he did that and people marveled. God set you free for a purpose. Not just for you to enjoy freedom, but for God to use your life as part of his mission. His mission of freedom, his mission of life change. Maybe it's just as simple as this guy. Jesus wants you to go home and tell your family and your friends what God has done for you and how he's had mercy in your life. Maybe it's to invite your unchurched friends to church with you. I mean, if you've experienced life change and you'd like them to experience life change, then it's, it's a matter of simply saying, hey, why don't you come with me? There's about 40,000 people in our community that don't identify a church home. They don't say, this is where I go to church, this is where I worship. That means there's a lot of people that you can go, hey, you want to go, go with me? Because it's really cool that, that God's done in my life, and I think he can do this in your life too. Maybe it's to, you know, tell your story of life change. There's some of you that got some great stories, and I'm dying to hear them. And yes, I'll just admit, I would love for some of you to make stories like Ted's and like others. And that may freak some of you out because God's nudging you right now saying you've got a story that needs to be heard. So just call and make an appointment. Let me uh, take you to lunch, hear your story. Uh, maybe for some of you, it's leading a ministry out of your pain, out of your past, out of your recovery. That God has taught you things and done things in your life and you're like, yeah, I, you know what? I, I can bless others in an official capacity and, and I want to step into that and lead a life group or, or lead a ministry. You see, here's what I know. If you really want to live free, then you will use your freedom to bless other people. That's a reality. Jesus came to set the prisoners free. Are you living in freedom? Because the choice is entirely yours. Let's pray.